enjoy it. My name is Chris Smith. I am your host every Thursday night at seven o'clock for the Science Cafe, where we find interesting people who think and do interesting things. And we give them a platform to share their work, their insights, knowledge, expertise across all fields of science and nature. And it's really exciting because we get to hear from them. We get to learn something new. That's always great, right? But also, after the chat, we have a chance for all of you, wherever you're watching and taking in the program today, to join in, post your thoughts, insights, questions, and we'll take those and share those with our guest speaker. So I'll remind you, you've got the chat box. If you're watching on YouTube, you can drop thoughts and comments there. And if you're watching over on Facebook, you have the comments thread over there to the side where you can leave your thoughts and questions as well for tonight's very special guest. I'll remind everybody too, let's see, the, let's see, my housekeeping notes say that the museum is open. That's right. If you didn't know, now you know. The Museum of Natural Sciences, our downtown Raleigh location, Prairie Ridge Eco Station, our Whiteville, North Carolina location, all back open to the public. Visit naturalsciences.org slash open in order to get all of the information that you need about how to get your free timed entry ticket and about the new hours of operation and the safety protocols that are in place. And I hope that we'll see you back at the Museum of Natural Sciences real soon, real soon. We've had a good time. We're glad to be back and welcoming people into the building. Now, for tonight's program, uh, we've called this program, this is book club night because we have with us the acclaimed and award-winning author, Ted Williams with us tonight. Uh, Ted's latest book is Earth Almanac, A Year of Witnessing the Wild, From the Call of the Loon to the Journey of the Gray Whale. Uh, you may be familiar with Ted's writing. He writes a monthly column called Recovery for the Nature Conservancy's Cool Green Science, and he is a longtime contributor to Audubon Magazine. Ted, welcome to the Science Cafe. Good to be with you, Chris. We're so glad that you could join us tonight. Uh, I'm really looking forward to, to having a chat with you because looking at just sort of flipping through the book, you have an incredible amount of outdoor nature experience, which I think we could all tap into and, and learn from. Like just how to experience the outdoors in a great way to like even the most minute of things to go and look for. Can you give us a sort of uh, summary and idea of what Earth Almanac is all about? Sure. Um, for 30 years, I wrote a column for Audubon called Insight, I-N-C-I-T-E, which is a feature-length column, about 3,500 words, on stuff that needed to be fixed, muckraking, uh, bad news, uh, but hopefully uh, training activists and advocates uh, to do better. And uh, a steady diet of that was... Uh, kind of a prescription for burnout. I wanted to do something um, to get people out just to see the uh, beauty and magic of nature. Uh, and the advocacy I thought would come later. So I wanted to do a, a companion column with Insight um, that would do that, uh, concentrating on the, on the good stuff that they could see. Uh, once they, they got into nature more, then they would advocates that we needed. So at first, the column was called uh, Earth Almanac. Somehow it morphed into, uh, I mean, uh, it was cat Earth Calendar, sorry. First it morphed into Earth Almanac. Um, so I wanted to emphasize, without being Pollyannish, the good news that's happened. I'm old enough to remember how it was in the 70s. In 1970, I went to work for the Massachusetts Division of Fisheries and Wildlife. And things were pretty grim. Uh, some people may not remember that. We didn't have an Endangered Species Act. We didn't have a Clean Water Act. We didn't have a Clean Air Act. We didn't have a National Environmental Policy Act. EDT was being blitzed all over the country. Um, a lot of species were in desperate trouble because of that. I had not seen a bluebird until I was 21. Uh, today, we have bluebirds everywhere. We have them nesting in our field. We have 
I put up uh, about 12 uh, bird boxes. And uh, we, we fledged maybe three broods a year now. Um, we never had any eagles nesting in Massachusetts. Now we have several dozen. Um, in our lake, in, we have a camp in New Hampshire, in our southern New Hampshire on lake. We never saw an eagle when I was a kid. You can't go out the lake now without at least seeing one or two, two a week. We never had any loons back then. Uh, we have nesting loons now. It's not really their habitat, but they're so successful. They're pushing south past their, their natural habitat. One of the reasons that they're doing so well is because most states have, have banned lead sinkers. And loons would eat one sinker and they, they, get, they die from lead poisoning. So now people are using um, non-toxic sinkers. It's making a huge difference. I mean, looking back, you know, in 2020, looking back at 1970, for example, looking back 40 or 50 years, it, it seems really easy to take for granted environmental protections, right? Like, like it would be easy for someone's <laughs> my age to visit a lake, see and hear loons, and just think that they've always been there. Or that, you know, the bluebirds nesting in my yard have, have just always been there. Exactly. I'm sure people remember at least reading about the Cuyahoga River catching on fire in the late 60s. Um, <laughs> a few years ago, I was out there uh, doing a story for Audubon, and uh, I went down and out on this allegedly polluted Dead Sea, Lake Erie, you could now see 40 feet down on the bottom um, is a commercial fishery on Lake Erie for yellow perch. Uh, um, six companies, more commercial fish than all the other great lakes in Hawaii. You have these gillnets that are coming up for 45 minutes just stuffed with 10 to 12 inch yellow perch. It doesn't make a dent in the population. Cuyahoga River now has, not only does it not catch fire, it has a run of steelhead trout, which are extremely sensitive um, salmonid that, that really can survive in the cleanest water. So that's the kind of stuff that I've seen happen. And the environmental groups, I don't, don't be grudging this, but they have to do fundraising. So they have to uh, emphasize stuff that needs to be fixed, the really bad news. The good news kind of gets forgotten. And because of that, uh, it, it engenders a sense of hopelessness. So I wanted to uh, address that in the book, the column, get people out uh, to notice stuff, sometimes even in their own backyard that they might have overlooked. There's tons of stuff happening, uh, even in the winter. You just have to know it. And it's, it's... So uh, with the book, presenting people with ways, uh, things for them to look for, a little bit of information to know when to find it, where to find it. Uh, the book, Earth Almanac does that really well, which I, I should remind everybody, Earth Almanac is available and there is a link in the video description if you're watching on YouTube, where you can click to actually purchase a copy of it. Uh, and you actually receive a, a signed copy. I do believe. But in Earth Almanac, uh, you sort of take us through season by season with, I don't know, would you say it's like the best of the best for what to look for? How did you go about including all the different, like this plant, that animal within each season? Well, I did have a lot of help from my editor, Connie Isbell. She, she thought of a lot of the ideas uh, and I if I didn't know much about them, I would research them, talk to biologists, get out and see them myself. Um, so I, we wanted to, to do it by seasons. Uh, we started off with winter, which uh, can be a tough season, but lots of is happening out there uh, that gets overlooked. Um, one of the thing, one of my favorite essays was spring tales, and. Uh, Snow is not a dead habitat. 
a lot is happening in the snow. And these ancient insects, which uh, were here 300 million years ago, just a little bit bigger than a grain of pepper, and they live in the snow. Unbelievable numbers. On relatively warm winter days, they come through and graze on the algae on top of the snow. And there might be uh, hundreds of thousands of these patches of snow. You might overlook it, you might think it's just Know, duff from, from dead trees. If you get down and look closely, you can see why they're called springtails. Because if you take the one, it will jump three or four inches into the air, which is the equivalent of a human jumping over the last table. And that's just one of the things. It's butterflies. Nobody thinks of butterflies you know, being out and about in the wintertime, but there are. Um, it's, if the temperature in the Northeast, for example, 45, 50 degrees for this many winter days. You're apt to see um, angle There's several species, morning cloak butterflies, beautiful black butterflies with yellow trim flying around. Um, commas, question mark butterflies. Um, people say, how can they possibly be hatching in the wintertime? Well, they're not hatching, they're hibernating. They come out of hibernation uh, and when it gets cold, they burrow under leaves. A good reason to leave some leaves in your yard, yard and on the edges of your yard. Break up everything. You're sending uh, a lot of these animals to some compost. I, I use uh, things like that as a great excuse to not break my yard or mow the grass that often. Much, exactly. much to my delight. And the grass is a horrible environment, a very sterile environment. So uh, mm -hmm. we, in our yard, we, we try to uh, encourage native plants. Uh, we do have some grass, but increasingly less. So you said Springtail was one of your favorite essays. Uh, do you have one that you'd like to share with us? Well, yeah. Um, see if I can find it. Uh, Little cunny or false albacore um, are a fish that I'm obsessed with and, and chase in the fall. It's the perfect time of year for them right now in the Northeast. They are the uh, perhaps the strongest uh, fish, game fish in the ocean for their size. Not very big, they don't get much over 10 or 15 pounds. Uh, they're also the nastiest eating. They're absolutely wild, which is good because nobody's bothering them. So it's all catch and relief. Um, and they, um, they're, they're just out there and they'll, they'll really um, impress people. I'll just read a little bit about them uh, from the essay. Little Tunny, AKA false albacore, control tropical and subtropical waters on both sides of the Atlantic. When the ocean temperatures peak in late summer, they stream north as far as Maine and Great Britain in shimmering elliptical shoals that cover two miles on the long axis. Most people even experienced anglers think they're bluefish or striped bass. Watch for the sickle tails and geysers of spray as these mini tuna swill bay anchovies and other bait fish. Often the school is attended by a cloud of screaming turns and gulls and dip and dive for leftovers. Few of these short-lived, fast-growing fish weigh more than 50 pounds. When they take your fly, they'll have 50 yards of line off your rear before you can snatch your bruised knuckles from the spinning hand. At the neck of the eastern funnel, inshore rips of Montauk, New York, my friends and I are at hand to watch and participate. Bobbing in little boats, we jockey for position around boils of striped bass packed so tightly that our flies sometimes ride on their backs. Such boils happen nowhere else. Bluefish that bite off our flies and if we're careless, slash our fingers and circle the stripers. Orbiting the bluefish are the shining mini tunes called false albacore or albies. Green backs cleaving the surface faster than anyone who hasn't caught one leaves a fish can swim. Bay anchovies, rain bait, erupt in panic sprays. Screaming terns and gulls pick them up along with 
Eel Silverside, Sand Eel Silverside's bunker, herring, and mullet, virtually from the maws of the predator fish. Lollies of gannets fall into the ways as it's shot by medieval archers. Sometimes when we squirt the ocean with our onboard hoses, albies, as we affectionately call them, show up expecting the rain bait. Out beyond the albies lurk bigger tunas, mackerel, marlin, swordfish, carnivorous sharks, whale sharks, baskin shark, dorado, ocean sunfish, leatherback sea turtles, porpoises, and whales. Thank you. Just, you know, the, I mean, that's beautiful stuff. It's, it's such evocative imagery. It's such a beautiful painting. Um, but one of the things that stands out to me, like hearing that essay uh, and, then, and then reading through Earth Almanac 2, was that a lot of these essays, they're not just uh, facts about animals or facts about plants, right? It's not like reading a field guide Here's how big it gets. Here's the color patterns. Here's when to see it. Uh, here's what it eats or here's what eats it. But that there's so much storytelling that goes into each one. You know, like the, the imagery you gave us of, you know, the, the person's fishing knuckles being bruised by the reel because of how fast the fish swims. Like that immediately creates such an interesting connection between the species, the animal, and and humans who are inevitably a part of the story for for any species that exists these days. I wanted to also um, report on, on behavior of some animals. Um, and and if, if you talk to biologists, they'll tell you that the play that animals engage in is, is uh, really a uh, practice for later battles for territory, et cetera. And uh, some of that's true, but, but um, they also, I'm convinced, play to play, to have fun. Just a short um, description here, and I'll read. Please. Humans, humans and wildlife, particularly our fellow mammals, are not so dissimilar as we like to suppose. We share many characteristics urge to play, for example. Biologists have proclaimed that playfulness in wild canids, ungulate bears, cats, and stellates, and rodents is merely practice for serious adult activity. Such as battles over territory or social hierarchy. This may be true. From my observations in the wild, I have no doubt that sometimes playfulness is just playfulness. That is, wild animals like humans play to have fun. Consider the essay, Winter Games which I report the following. An otter will pluck a pebble from the bottom of a river or lake, surface with it, drop it, swim under it, catch it on its forehead, slip and turn back to the surface, the pebble still in place, and start the game anew. Now, what useful activity could otters possibly be practicing for this game? Swimming agility? I doubt it. They need this exercise about as much as professional baseball players need t-ball sets. Otters, like lots of other creatures, including us, simply enjoy sport. To, not, to deny this fact is not only unscientific, it dismisses wildlife and the wonder of nature. Another species that, that I watch playing in my backyard are tree swallows. And I mentioned to you earlier that tree swallows are doing really well now uh, because of blueberry boxes. Um, the whole blueberry box is small enough to exclude Bluebird and the tree swallow's major competitor for nests, which is starlings, an alien introduced from Europe. Um, so anyway, these, these tree swallows will take a feather and fly up several hundred feet, drop it, come down and catch it on the way down, fly up again and catch it on the way down again. There'll be five or six participating. This obviously isn't practice for catching insects. They, they you know, insects are far more challenging swallow the catch. They're going to have fun. Right? And to deny this is unscientific. 
I'm reminded of a video that uh, made several rounds through the internet of a crow on the snowy roof of a building sledding down. I saw the this. Steep roof. This was wonderful. Just playing. That's all it is. And, and there, there's no, I, like, how else do you explain what right. that bird is doing besides that? Fun. Fun. I mean, it looks fun to me. I'd do it. All right, of course. Probably not as successfully as the crow was, but, but I'd <laughs> probably try it at least. Ravens, for example, form a circle and they'll, they'll pass a stone back and forth a moment ago. What possible practice could this be? It's a game like, like pitch and catch. <laughs> so what have been some of your favorite observations of wildlife? I mean, you've been out, uh, I mean, gosh, all over the place taking in observations. What would you say are some of your top stories? Well, um, it's, it's, that's tough to say. I, I think winter is, is challenging because you have to look hard for what's going on, but a lot is going on. And ruffed grouse, one of my favorite birds, um, actually grow snowshoes. They grow little tabs on their feet, walk in the snow. And you can see the progress of these snowshoes from early winter to late winter. At first, there's not much for tracks, and there's more. And they will burrow under the snow as it warms. It never gets below 32 degrees under the snow. So several times I've been out hiking in the winter and stepped and the grouse will burst up uh, a foot from you and throw snow in your face. And really that gets your attention. That's I would cool. imagine so. Oh my gosh. My, my, my favorite thing is to see that. So it happened a few times for me. But just, if you go out in the winter, um, dress properly. There's no such thing as bad weather, only bad clothing. Uh, start with boots. You have, your, your boots are important because your feet will get cold if you don't have the right your gloves. Then the next is your hands. Cortex gloves work best for me. Thick, thick cortex keep the heat in. Get a track guide. And that will tell you um, what tracks you're looking at in the snow. So, you know, sometimes you may not, not see another animal, but you'll see signs of the animal. You might see the wing marks of raptors where they've tried uh, or succeeded in catching a uh, rodent. And there might be a drop of blood on the top of those wing marks. Look for, for birds. Don't forget that um, as, we, as we lose our birds to go south, we're also south of many northern. So look for northern birds coming down the cold of the winter, the more you might see. Great gray owls from far north come down, snowy owls, red poles, snow bunting, uh, white, white, white eyed crossbills, red breasted, rose breasted, red breasted nut hatches, um, boreal chickadees, a lot of stuff that's happening in the winter. Mig migrations come as, as well as go. So then what does it take to be uh, a skillful observer of nature? Um, right, like to, to go out and notice that, that those are springtails on top of the snow uh, or, right, like some of these things are so small. Like I might notice uh, the vultures that are hanging out because there will be a dozen of them surrounding a carcass. You go, okay, there's, the, the nature's right there. It's big right. and it's easy to see. But even those things, people seem to uh, ignore and overlook. So how does someone become a skillful observer? Well, I, I think that maybe reading a book like mine where it tells you what to look for, uh, nature guides, then, then make an effort to look for those. And, um, and then just practice. Um, go out and if you see something that you're not sure of, look it up. Uh, fungi, winter, uh, there's a lot of uh, 
bracket, tree brackets uh, grow on trees. Artist fund funding, uh, look, look for those. The more you do it, the more you'll see, the more you'll understand. Is there, is there an art to it? And I guess the way I think about it is I can look on, uh, you know, like take a social media platform like Instagram. And as the seasons progress, I can see people gravitating towards bright, colorful flowers. And then sometimes you get photos of the bright flowers and sometimes you get the flowers and the insects that are in the flowers. But I see very little outside of the bright, colorful flowers. But there's so much more happening. I mean, you've got a couple dozen essays, you know, per season on several dozen, I should say, on each season about which, you know, all of the diversity of things that's, that's going on, besides the ones that are the most obvious. Right. Spring is, is interesting as it's fall because you're so much is happening. You're overwhelmed. You kind of don't know how to separate it. Migrations coming and going. Mm -hmm. Fall is my, my favorite season. Since it's fall, maybe I should just read you a quick essay on fall fever. While, uh, while not immune to spring-induced giddiness, members of the Williams family are far more afflicted with a previously undescribed malady called fall fever. You feel the first symptoms on those crisp mornings just prior to the autumnal equinox when morning glories open in the south garden wall. When our late fall silence save the lopping of waves and gobbling of northern ducks, Aspens and tamaracks go smoky gold, swamp maples blaze, and the azure sky is one shade richer than at any other time of the year. All brings the fragrance of wood smoke, leaf smoke, the sweet rotten scent of frost killed worms and deer bitten apples, young grouse and the touch me nots, woodcocks fluttering moth like into bare alder runs at dusk, all geese barking as if from treetop level. And yet so high, they look like ribbons of crepe tacked to the corners of the crescent. As Joni Mitchell and our friend Tom Rush sing, they've got the birds for go, they've got the wings to go. Migrations of geese and other waterfowl are noticed by most people, even those generally oblivious to other things in the natural world. But the greatest migrations on earth pass unseen by all but a few thousand Americans. They happen not with mammals on old world steps, savannas, or even birds along busy flyways. Sea creatures underwater along the west and east coasts. Thank you. So you said fall is your favorite season. Um, I, I guess initially I was, I would have thought that winter you, you led the book with, with the winter season uh, and right. you've got this great line about the dead of winter not being accurate. Uh, so I, I kind of thought maybe like the, the allure of winter was where it was going to be. Fall surprises me. Yeah, fall. A lot of people, their favorite time of year is spring. And I like all the seasons. I, mean, I try to get out on all the seasons. Um, in the book I mentioned ice fishing, uh, not with tip-ups, but with small jigger sticks. Uh, it's a great way to get kids out in the wintertime. And it's amazing what you see on the ice when you're, when you're fishing for perch and sunfish. Jigger stick. Um, I mentioned once a, a misty winter day, a, a huge fisher cat came, came following out of the swamp and practically stepped on my toes I had to grab my, my Brittany puppy by the hind legs and wanted to play with it. Wish you wouldn't think that was 
much fun. Bald eagles calling all the eagles. Before there were any bald eagles, really, in many things like that. Uh, muskrats on the ice, uh, musk turtles on the ice. Why would turtles be on the ice? That took me a long time to figure out. One day I found a musk turtle just on the ice in a warm one day here, and I, I took it and put it on this little eye opening from the ice on the shore. I put it in the water. And I found another, and then I went looking for them. I found two more. And my theory is that herring gulls pick them up and drop them like they do with shells to break them. To eat. And when they hit the soft, mushy ice, they don't break. And the seagull, the uh, herring gulls, are frustrated. That's the only explanation I could come up with. <laughs> it sounds like a good one. Yeah, how, yeah, turtles out on the ice. Well, I know that the herring gulls drop turtles on rocks to eat them because I've seen that in the lake of New Hampshire. So that's, that made sense to me. Turtles obviously didn't come up on the ice of their own accord. Wouldn't, wouldn't have done that. There's nothing on the ice to get them, do some to come there. <laughs> So uh, I'm going to grab a question from, from the chat over here. How long did it take from initial idea to publishing for Earth Almanac? Well, um, for me, not, nothing, no time at all, because it was thought of by my editor, Roger Cohn at Audubon. And uh, it's something I wanted to do. I, I, I did talk to him a lot about writing other stuff that wasn't this muckraking, steady diet of, of uh, disaster. Uh, and that was his solution, was something I loved. And they gave me a two page spread, with beautiful illustration, mostly photographs. And then, uh, as I said, it was first a calendar. For some reason, I got changed. And for the book, uh, one of the most painful things for me was just cutting copy to fit this two-page spread because with all the illustrations, I couldn't you know, fit everything I wanted to say into the spread. So in this book, all the stuff that was cut out for space reasons, uh, I, I resurrected and it's back in there. So a lot of material that people would not have seen if they had read all of it. All the all the stuff cut for space. Right. <laughs> and of course, the nice thing about this book is, is space wasn't wasn't an issue. <laughs> you could you could print every word. Absolutely. <laughs> all right. Uh, okay. There's a comment here from. Well, let's see. Mary. It looks like Mary Lynn posted it. But it says, "Hi, my name is Izzy. I am nine. I am watching with my mom. Hi, thanks for watching. Okay, what is your favorite season? And do you think kids should catch turtles and play in creeks? Absolutely, they should catch turtles. Um, we did as kids. My favorite season again is fall. You probably didn't hear that. But uh, turtles are important for, for children. Uh, we, we caught them. Uh, we had a turtle cage. We kept them for three or four days. It's important to let them go. It's also important to let them go in the places you found them. We don't want to outlaw kids. Same with frogs. And Massachusetts has a limit on bullfrogs. People catch them and eat their legs. Um, but we didn't want to outlaw kids from catching them and playing with them when they were that's, that's how kids get into nature. That's very important. Probably better leave the snapping turtles than they are. It's not yeah. quite easy for you. But one interesting thing about the snapping turtles that I found out when I was a kid, well, they'll bite you terribly on the land. They'll take a finger off. They won't bite you underwater. You can go up and tickle their chins underwater. They won't bite you. They're perfectly capable of it, but they, they feel secure in their habitat. There's no need to bite. 
I might, I might suggest Izzy not test that hypothesis, but. Yeah, don't test it. And yeah. <laughs> except, there's an exception to every rule. Mm. And uh, the exception is my, my good friend Kay Snyder used to catch bluegills and dangle them off the dock in a chain. At night, the old snapper would come up and help himself to a bluegill. One day she was marinating an inner tube in the lakes down there. The snapper came up and bit her on the leg. And the reason she did, the snapper didn't take a chunk out of it was he was hoping for a blue. What part of this tastes terrible? And uh, so she got a nice triangular bruise on her thigh. That was all. That got her attention. Yeah, I bet it would. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> Snapping turtles sneaking up on you. That's, yeah, that would, it might, it might give you a little bit of a jump. And the other turtles will, will bite too. So, you know, keep your fingers out of them. They won't bite you like snappers, but they will. They'll keep your fingers away from your mouths. And uh, our most loved and most common turtle, painted turtles, are, are uh, very cool species. You can see them walking under the ice sometimes. The ice is clear. And they're one of the few turtles that can live with no oxygen in the water. Uh, sometimes in ponds, turtles run out of oxygen. And uh, they, their metabol metabolism slows down. They actually ingest uh, oxygen through their anus. And uh, when they run out, a lot of turtles will die. Painted turtles have a way of converting calcium to oxygen. So almost always they can make it through. If it lasts too long, then of course they run out of calcium and shell deteriorates. That happens very infrequently. Nature's amazing. <laughs> the, whole, the, just the diversity, the adaptations. What would you say has been some of the more surprising observations or experiences. I mean, like there's surprise when a when a grouse comes exploding out of the snow. Oh, that was a huge surprise. Right, right. But <laughs> a couple of feet from your face. That was probably the most surprising uh, thing that's happened to me. But uh, uh, I think the one of the pleasant pleasant surprises seeing the huge resurgence in some of these species. Pileated woodpecker. We never saw a pileated woodpecker when we were kids. Now, we have an island in New Hampshire that's mostly forested, about 250 acres. They weren't there. And I cannot walk on that island now without at least hearing or seeing a pileated woodpecker. I don't know why they've come back. Uh, they weren't affected by much by DDT, but maybe Maybe the old growth is, is they need old trees. Um, they're one of the few birds that, if their nest and cavity of a tree is destroyed, pick up their eggs, fly with them to the cavity. If you're out in the woods, you hear one, take a stick and bang it on a, on a tree. And sometimes they'll fly in to see who's making comp what the competition is. Making you know, you had one of your essays had a similar uh, suggestion for conversing with coyotes. Right, right. <laughs> Just to find a meadow or the shores of a lake and and how. I've, I've done that. And uh, what was interesting is I went out to Minnesota to do an article on wolves. And I hung out with Jim Brandenburg, who makes these wonderful photos of wolves, um, paid for his house one photo of a wolf, use an Audubon, half a wolf, you can see it, half his face behind the tree. And uh, we went out, he taught me to howl for wolves. So when I came back east, um, Massachusetts and Maine and Pennsylvania, I couldn't talk coyote, but I could talk wolf. And the coyotes here have never heard wolves, but they instinctively know what that is. And I think they know it's a fake, but they can't resist commenting and, and if I howl for wolves, we assume I'm left out of the conversation and coyotes take over. I'm trying to learn coyote, but I'm 
not quite there yet. I, the the way coyote populations are going, I think we'll all get a chance to learn coyote. We have them in our, in our backyard in Grafton, Massachusetts, suburbia. Beautiful animals. I don't know why people hate them so much. They're very unpopular. All the deer hunters think that they kill the deer. Well, they, they to, to for a coyote to tackle an adult deer, pretty dangerous mission. Yeah, sure. They they take a wounded deer or sick deer, fawns. They they have absolutely no effect on the population. There are way too many deer in the east as it is because we've eliminated the obligate predators, which are cougars and wolves. So they're destroying. Habitat, including their own habitat, and wiping out a lot of new um, nesting uh, birds. And um, hunters can't possibly take care of it themselves because deer are smart. They, they learn to be out at night. They learn, for example, in our island, New Hampshire, there's no hunting. And as soon as the hunting season starts, deer flood onto it. They know it very well safe there. It's not an island to them because they can swim across you know, 100 feet from the opposite shore. They can walk over the bridge. In the wintertime, the lake is drained and they walk on the mud or the ice. All right, I'm looking at some of the comments that are coming in on Facebook right now. Uh, we've got we, uh, Dawn watching has uh, much love for turtles, especially baby turtles. Uh, Dawn says, in spring, you can find a lot of baby turtles. Right. And then uh, Dawn says, not to put you on the spot, but isn't the nose the way you tell them apart? One is more pointy for different kinds of... Well, turtles? that's true. Um, uh, the musk turtle, for example, has a very pointed no nose. Um, you, you'll find a lot of uh, baby painted turtles in the spring. Um, they've overwintered. They have antifreeze in their blood. Uh, they can actually freeze and, and, and hatch in the spring. They'll, they'll nest. Sometimes you can track turtles to their nest um, um, later in the summer um, by following their footprint. It's pretty cool. Just watch them and let them do their thing. Play their eggs. Wood turtles are, are a troubled species. People pick them up and sell them. That trade, which is illegal. Um, beautiful turtle. They're, they're um, spend some time in, in the stream in, in the winter and spring. Most of the time, they're, they're just in the woods. You call wood turtles not because they're in the wood, but because their backs look like carved wood. Gorgeous. Gorgeous critters. They are. Yeah. And we have spotted turtles too in the swamps. They're, they're a little bit in trouble. We have to conserve them. And I, I would urge kids if they're going to collect turtles, don't let the spotted turtles, the wood turtles, be. You know? It's okay to pick up a painted turtle, play with it for a while, make sure you let it go where you found it. Don't keep it more than two or three or four days. So at the close to the start of the the show here, you were talking about how there's a lot of bad news in the environmental world. The, right. There is there's habitat loss and species loss, degradation, pollution, uh, things like that, and that you wanted to sort of step away from the bad news and, and give people this sense of how great the natural world still is and how, how, how much, you know, great diversity and great stories and there's amazing things to see. And, and also that there's been such progress made in the last 50 years when it comes to protecting the environment and making it uh, available for people to get out and actually recreate in and to get close to nature. 
once right. more. Right. And, and and my mission was if, they, if people can get out and get interested and fascinated with nature and see the magic and beauty, then they will become, become activists, advocates. And they will try to correct some of the things that are wrong. But again, so much good news that doesn't get reported. And, you know, I'm sure you're, you're old enough to remember acid rain. Huh? That was going to wipe out everything. It was a terrible light. And we pretty much have solved that. Uh, mm -hmm. We could do the same with climate change. If we get an administration that takes it seriously. Um, so the, there's a lot of stuff that we, we can do if people care. But uh, don't get hopeless because you know, we've seen tremendous progress in recovery. And a lot of these species didn't have them. What would you say are some of the the things that people can do when it comes to protecting and conserving species? Well, the most important thing is they can vote. Vote for politicians who care about fish and wildlife and the environment. We have a lot of politicians that don't. Um, they can be activists locally and nationally. Um, get on your conservation commission. If you see something wrong in your town, um, you know, write some uh, letters to the editor. Um, start a group. If you're on a lake and we don't, it doesn't have a lake protection association, start one. Um, uh, if the lake has exotic alien weeds, get get um, program to, to get rid of them. Uh, best way is if, if it's possible, it's mechanical removal. Not like in New Hampshire, we have aerial, variable milfoil, alien species that takes over habitat. We've been tremendously successful moving with divers and a suction pump. So, uh, just become activists and advocates. And get outside. And get outside, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> You know, at the, for us at the Museum of Natural Sciences, um, right, we're, we're a natural history museum. So people come, at least, you know, for the main location that we have in downtown Raleigh, people come inside the building to become immersed in nature. So people come in and they can find, uh, you know, stories about species that live at the bottom of the ocean and they can find they can find birds, plants, reptiles, amphibians, and you know, and there's there's taxidermy where people can see the things up close in a way that they might not in the wild. And you know, and then we have the the interpretive panels, you know, the the reading panels, so that people can sort of get little tidbits and stories about these different things. <coughs> and I think one of the great <coughs> things about uh, what we have, at, at least at, at our museum, and I claim no credit for it because I haven't <coughs> been there for that long, but it's that the, the dioramas and the exhibits that we have, you know, people have to walk through them in order to get from one to the other. So instead of looking into an alcove and imagining the, the scenery, you know, people inside our museum are walking through the trees and, you know, they're walking it's almost as if they're walking through the dioramas themselves without creating uh, <laughs> disturbance. So there's this, and you're, you're, what I guess what I'm getting at is that your, your book in itself does such a fantastic job of putting people into the place and into the scene and then giving them that information without having to actually take them physically into the place and, and share it with them. Which I have to say, we do that at the museum too. We take people into these places and show them uh, the great wonder of nature around them. And what, that will get them inspired and, and right. looking for it when they, when they leave. We hope so. We hope so. You know, uh, 
as written right now, the, the mission of our museum is to illuminate the natural world and inspire its conservation. Uh, and you know, I think it's because we see that there's, there's value, there's benefit of sharing this information with people in a way that connects and resonates with them um, at the same time that we inspire people and motivate people to want to care for it. And this thing, uh, I'm probably very biased in that, in, in that aspect since I work at a natural history museum or since, or since you've spent so much time writing about the outdoors and the species that exist in it. When we took our kids to the Peabody Museum, awesome. And that, I think that, you know, there were a lot of um, dioramas and stuff, but that, that inspired them to get out, outside too and look for different stuff, but natural stuff. That was important. So I think my last, the question that I'll leave with uh, is tomorrow morning, folks are gonna, or tomorrow, maybe Saturday, we'll, we'll pick a weekend. Okay. Saturday, Saturday morning, all our viewers are gonna get up and they're gonna have this still rattling around in their brains a little bit. And they're gonna step out into their yard, their patio, their park. What should they look for? Well, they should look for anything in the wild. Birds, butterflies, insects, dragonflies. Some dragonflies migrate. Get a field guide, bring a field guide. Probably have a bird book or a butterfly book. Great butter, uh, book called uh, Butterflies and Binoculars by Jeff Glassberg. Take that, see if you can identify just two or three species of birds. They're flying now clouded sulfur, this is their flight time uh, in the Northeast few others. Um, see if you can identify a few birds. Uh, if you can't see the bird, sometimes you can hear the, the song or the call. And there's some great bird tapes uh, put out by Audubon and others. You can learn the, the vocalizations of these birds, especially warblers, uh, which are now migrating south. Uh, they're not so vocal now as they are in the spring but you can hear them occasionally. Um, so if you, if you can't see them, at least you can identify them. Um, look for migrating hawks this time of year. Uh, they're, they'll take a thermal and they'll spiral up on the thermal uh, fairly high and they can glide for 20 miles without flapping their wings. So they hit another thermal. Um, sometimes you can see kettles several thousand Broadway hawks, for example. Uh, my wife and I do that. We go out to Mount Wachusett, central Massachusetts. If you hit it right on uh, the north wind, you can see incredible amount, amounts of uh, raptors migrating. And uh, sometimes we'll be in radio contact with people on Mount Katahdin saying, here comes you know, five bald eagles, or here comes a kettle of Broadway. And uh, 20 minutes later, there they'll be. So look for look for anything. Uh, if you don't know what it is, uh, pay pay attention, remember it, and look it up. Excellent stuff, Ted. Thank you very much for being here. It was great to be with you. Thank you. Right. I guess I should say thanks for being there <laughs> with us. Yeah. <laughs> Really appreciate it. Excellent stuff. Uh, I'll remind everybody, the book is Earth Almanac, Ted Williams. Uh, on YouTube, if you're watching the video on YouTube, the link to purchase the book is down below in the, in the, it's not in the chat box. It's part of the video description down below the video right now. So give that a click, check it out, and hope that you enjoy it. You can follow along with everything that's happening at the Museum of Natural Sciences by visiting naturalsciences.org. And I should throw out there, since we're talking about uh, getting out in nature, looking at things, figuring out what they are and learning about them. If you find something out there when you're exploring and you don't know what it is, but you can get 
a, a half decent picture of it, you can actually send that to us at the museum and we'll try to identify it for you too. So if you're having trouble with an identification, whether you've got rocks, you think you've got a fossil, plants, animals, go to naturalsciences.org. There you can find the Ask a Naturalist page and you can actually submit your observations there. And we have a huge team of biologists, ecologists, conservationists, naturalists. We can do our paleontologists, geologists. We can do our very best to try to figure out what it is you've got and what it is you saw and then get you the proper ID. So cool service. Of course, it's free, just like it's free to visit the Museum of Natural Sciences. So take advantage of that. And that's run out of the Naturalist Center at the museum. You can follow the museum on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram as well. We're at Natural Sciences on all three. And of course, you can subscribe to the museum's YouTube channel right here. That way you get notifications every time we're bringing you another great nature program just like this one. Once more, Ted, it's been, it was great talking with you. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. It's been great talking to you too. All right, everybody. Stay safe. Take care. We'll see you next week. Good night. Good night.